Welcome everyone. We still have several people joining, um, but uh, just wanted to welcome you. Thanks for joining us today for our class on plant choices that attract pollinators. Um, we're really excited for this topic. We have a lot of people registered today. Um, and most of you are experts at this uh, Zoom stuff by now, um, but we ask that you keep your mic muted um, through the presentation. Um, the presentation today will last approximately an hour, and then we're going to hold questions until the end. So um, if you have any questions, if you don't mind just typing them in the chat as we, as, uh, we go through the talk, and then we will answer those um, uh, our speaker will answer those at the end of the talk. Um, that way we can stay on track and keep on time um, and, uh, and work that out. So we will um, wait for more people to join and then we'll get started very soon. And yes, everybody is an expert because you're already putting your name in the chat box. So we also ask that you put your name in the chat box, which helps us with our registration list. So welcome everyone. We will get started very shortly. We still have several people joining in here. Um, we're excited about this class on plant choices that attract pollinators. If you don't mind as you join um, to be sure that your mic is muted. Um, and if you wanna put your name in the chat box that will help us um, with our registration list. Um, just a reminder, if you have already signed up for the rest of the classes in our series, then great, you're good to go. Um, but if you only signed up for this one or previous ones and you are interested in our next uh, classes coming up, uh, next week we have Backyard Birds, the following Thursday, the 18th, we have Bats of Kentucky, and then in March, um, the first three Thursdays in March will be all focused around food. And um, we have just uh, planned our next set of classes um, uh, April through June, um, and those will be posted very soon in the next week or so. So be on the lookout for our next um, sessions that will be in April uh, through June. So we're excited about some great topics then. So Shannon, if you don't mind, I'm going to give it one more minute, if that's okay, and then I'll go ahead and introduce you and we'll get started. Sounds good. Great. You think? Okay, we will go ahead and get started here. Thank you all for joining um, today. As I mentioned, if you could please make sure that you um, keep your mic muted through the, the talk. Um, this talk is gonna last approximately an hour and then uh, we will do questions following that. So if you wanna just type your questions in as we go and while you're thinking of it through the talk, you can put those in the chat box down below. You can click the little icon that says chat and you can type your question in there and then we will go through those at the end of the talk um, so that Shannon can answer those for you. 
Um, so we're really excited uh, to have Shannon Trimboli today um, as our speaker on plant choices that attract pollinators. Uh, Shannon is a wildlife bi biologist, educator, author, and beekeeper who lives in Barron County, Kentucky. Her goal is to help people connect with the nature around them. Um, she's host of the Backyard Ecology, of Backyard Ecology, which is a weekly podcast um, focused on igniting our curiosity and nature, natural wonder, exploring our, exploring our yards and communities, and improving our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Um, and it's a great podcast. I follow that and really enjoy it, Shannon, so thanks for that. Um, Shannon also owns and operates Busy Bee Nursery and Consulting, which specializes in plants, and habitat consulting services for honeybees, native pollinators, and wildlife conservation. And her first book, Plants, Honeybees, Using the Ohio and Tennessee Valleys, was published in 2018. And I also have that book and refer to it a lot. So um, thank you for that. And I will turn it over to you. Hey, hi, everyone. Thanks, Faye, for the introduction. And thank you all that's on this talk for spending part of your day with me. I am so excited to have this opportunity to chat with all of you all. Now, the topic is plant choices that attract pollinators. So obviously we're going to talk about plants. And I know some of you probably came expecting me to give you a list of plant A, B, C, and D to get pollinators. And I promise you, I will give you a list of plants at the end. We will talk about specific plants, but if that's all you want, you really don't have to be on this topic, on this conversation. Google plants that attract butterflies, planting, planting for honeybees or planting for bees. You're going to get a million different lists. I mean, there's all kinds of lists out there that give you specific plants, but let's face it, they may be easy, and they certainly keep us from having to make more decisions because we're all in decision overload right now. We're all in information overload. We're tired of thinking and making decisions. That's just life. Um, but even, those, the, even though those generic lists that we can Google and find on the internet, they work. But do they work well? Are they the best choice? Because let's face it, my garden and my yard here in Barron, Kentucky, is very different, or could be very different, it may be the similar, but it's going to be different than your yards. It's going to be different than somebody who's in urban, downtown Louisville, because I'm out in the country. Um, I'm in a very rural area. We have very different situations, and that's just here in Kentucky, because let's face it, there's people all over the place um, I noticed just as people were putting up on the chat where they're from, we've got people from Indiana here. And those lists, we don't know where they came from. So somebody in California or Maine or Florida, we've all got different situations. I call them the one-size-fits-all lists. And they're kind of like one-size-fits-all clothing. They'll work, but they may not be our best choices. So we're actually going to start out with talking about some of those concepts, those basic concepts to keep in mind for choosing plants that are going to attract pollinators. Because if you learn these concepts, then you're going to be in a much better position to pick and choose and evaluate the different plants that you have available to you, either that's already growing in your gardens and in your surrounding lands. Because I'm going to assume most of us already have flower gardens. Most of us already have trees or plants growing in or around our homes. We don't, we're not starting from scratch. So we've already got stuff there. Let's use that. Let's evaluate that and see how it fits into everything else. Um, we've got different plants available to us, even just going to the stores because we've, going to different stores. We've got different friends. We've got different family members who might be giving, me, giving us some of those plants. Let me give you the concepts, the choices, the decisions to make, or the questions to ask as you make those decisions. And that will help you make better choices on your own for what plants are going to be best for you and your garden. And they're going to attract the pollinators best for you. And then, like I said, we're going to wrap up with that list of plants that 
I really like that work really well in my garden that I know are going to grow well in Kentucky and will attract pollinators. And then you can use what we've already talked about to evaluate and choose whether those are the best plants for your, excuse me, for your garden or your yard. So as we get started, there we go. Obviously with the title, Plant Choices That Attract Pollinators, we're going to talk about plants. And I've already told you we're going to talk about specific plants. And I don't wanna to get too far down this rabbit hole, but I do think that it's really important to recognize before we even start talking about those plant choices, that it's about more than just pretty flowers because we want to attract the pollinators in there and we all do the same thing and I've done it too, I still do it. First thing that pops into my head when I think about attracting pollinators, it's pretty flowers. I want lots of pretty flowers. It's just the way we think, it's what we like, it's what we've come to believe is that you need these lots of pretty flowers. And we're going to talk about pretty flowers. But when it comes to attracting pollinators, if we really want those pollinators to thrive, not just survive, but thrive and do well, then we've got to have pollinator habitat, which means create, um, providing food for the adults, which usually is pretty flowers in one form or another. We need to be providing food for the babies, which may or may not be the same thing, often is not the same thing as our um, adult food. And then we need to provide year-round shelter for these pollinators because we may not see our native bees or our butterflies, adult butterflies out and about during the cold winter months like right now. But oftentimes they're there. They're still in our gardens, in our areas. We just don't see them. And so often we forget about providing that winter habitat. So it's about a lot more than pretty flowers if you really want to help these pollinators thrive. Now, when we think pollinators, you say pollinators, the first thing that's gonna pop into most people's mind is a bee. That's typically what we think of first. And more specifically, we think of the honeybee, the Western honeybee, which isn't even native to Kentucky or North America. And although it's kind of the poster child of both bees in general and non-native bees, we have quite a few other species here in Kentucky and throughout North America that are non-native bee species. They've been introduced either for agricultural purposes or just accidentally introduced. But in addition to these non-native bees, we have like 4,000 different species of bees that are native to North America. Not all of those are native to Kentucky, here in Kentucky, we've got, oh, a few hundred um, native bee species. I can't get a really good number, like 555 or anything like that. I don't know that that number exists, but it's definitely in the several hundred um, ballpark figure. And these bees that I just put up are just a few of the bees that are native to Kentucky and native to the eastern U.S. that I'm gonna guess most of us have in our gardens and some of them are absolutely amazing. I mean, just teeny tiny little things sometimes. Brilliant emerald green, brilliant blues. Oh my gosh, they are just amazing little things to look at. But if you're not thinking of bees when you think of pollinators, you're probably thinking about butterflies. And usually we're talking about, or the things that pop into most people's minds, are those big, flashy, charismatic butterflies. The monarch, which is our poster child for butterflies right now. And things like the tiger swallowtail, which is one of my favorite. I just love the bright yellow and black contrast on the flowers. But again, we've got lots and lots of other species of butterflies. Here's a few others that you're likely to find in your garden. And not all butterflies actually go to flowers or can be found in like what we would think of as an open flower garden. There's some that stay more in the woods. There's some that feed on sap. Oh my gosh, the diversity of butterflies is again, absolutely phenomenal, absolutely amazing. But we have other pollinators as well. Some of our moths are pollinators. Both are 
moths that are active during the day, like our, get over here, like our, we often call it the hummingbird moth. It's actually, if we're going to be more specific, it's the snowberry clear, clearwing or bumblebee moth. Um, there's another species that in most other areas they call the bumblebee or the hummingbird moth, but it's more red and green, and I'll show you a picture of it later on in the presentation. This one is more yellow and black, so it looks more like a bumblebee than a hummingbird, but I grew up in Kentucky. Everybody I know has called it hummingbird moth. I call it hummingbird moth most of the time. So that one, it, you'll see it on a lot of your flowers throughout the summer months. We also have night blooming flowers and some of our moths that are active at night are also pollinators. This white flower, if you look carefully, there's a moth hidden on it. And at night, it's active, it's pollinating the plants. During the daytime, it's very well camouflaged as it hides out. But there's also other pollinators. Some of our flies are pollinators. And some of the flies that are pollinators that you'll, and that you'll find on our flowers, they look like house flies. Boring, regular house flies. Others look like a house fly, but they've got these beautiful green and blue bodies. And then others, the ones that we usually see or pay more attention to, are like this one that's up here now. It's a flower fly or a hover fly or a serifid fly. And goes by all the different names. The serifid flies, that's the genus of flies that it's in. But they're bee mimics. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen pictures, even in like magazines or on websites and stuff, and they're talking about this bee, and I'll look at the picture and it's a fly. It's one of these. Um, people get them confused all the time. But yeah, there's these beautiful flower flies that are bee mimics. Some of our beetles are also pollinators. Um, some of them are more accidental pollinators, so they just kind of brush a little bit of the pollen on accidentally. Some of them are more traditional, better pollinators. But yeah, there's lots of beetles that are pollinators. And the list goes on and on with our invertebrates and our insects. And then of course, there's everybody's favorite of the vertebrate pollinators, especially in the Eastern US, the hummingbird. Now, Having looked at this amazing, fantastic diversity of pollinators and how different they all are, I'm going to be honest, most of us don't really pay attention to or care that much about a lot of these different types. I mean, I've had people come to me and say, hey, Shannon, what can I plant for the bees? Can you give me some ideas? I have never once had anybody come to me and say, hey, Shannon, what can I plant for the beetles? By the same token, people talk to me all the time about wanting to create butterfly gardens. Never once have I had somebody say, I want to plant a fly garden. How do I plant a fly garden? Tell me what to plant for flies. Yeah, yeah. Um, just doesn't work that way. And I'll be on, and again, I'll be honest with you. I don't ask myself those questions. When those animals are on the flowers that I've planted for the bees and the butterflies and the hummingbird, um, I love watching them. I mean, it's just amazing the diversity that I see there. I'm a nature nerd. I'm not going to hide it. I love getting out there and watching all the little critters on the flowers. But I'm not out there specifically planting for the flies or the beetles or even the moths or any of the other insects that are good pollinators in their own right. So we're going to accept the reality of things. And today we're just going to talk about the butterflies, the bees, and the hummingbirds when we're talking about pollinators. And really, if you apply the concepts that I'm going to give you and have this wide diversity of plants, you're going to attract everything else as well. You just don't have to tell all your neighbors and friends that you're trying to attract the fly pollinators because they're probably going to look at you like you're a little crazy or crazier than they already think you are in my case. Also, when we're talking about choosing our plants for pollinators, I think it's important to at least touch on some things that are important general rules for how to plant those and make them the most attractive to your pollinators. Because you can have the best plant for pollinators, but they've got to be able to see it. They've got, you've got to get, be able to get them to come in. So 
And doing that, you want to, first of all, make sure you have at least three things blooming in every season. And that's just so that you've got lots of flowers there. There's always something going on. There's always something blooming. And if you make those three different types of things blooming, then you're going to have a better chance of attracting more different types of pollinators in. You also want to have a minimum of a three foot by three foot block of each species planted. Now, when I first read that, I was like, that's way too big. There's no way that somebody who has a small urban or suburban yard is going to be able to plant three foot by three foot of each species that they want to have, especially not if you also want to have three things blooming in every season. I mean, come on, the just logistically doesn't work. But having that three foot by three foot block or at least those blocks instead of one individual plant is important because it makes it easier for the pollinators to see. They're just attracted to, as they're flying over you, they're going to see those big blocks. They're going to be attracted to their easier. It makes it easier to find those plants. Also, it's not as big as, at least in my mind, I was picturing. I mean, you may have a better concept of just hearing that and knowing what, how big that is, but I didn't. And the reason why I realized that that wasn't so big was I remembered my grandmother. My grandmother was a seamstress. She loved to sew. She was always making quilts. She made every one of my dresses as I was like, when I was little. I mean, it was wonderful. And we would go to the fabric store. And she had grown up during the Depression era, so she was very frugal, very careful when she was buying fabric. And one of the things that I remember her doing when we went to the fabric stores when I was little is she would measure out the fabric however much we needed before she took it out, took it up to the counter to have it cut. And then she would look front and back to see if there were any nicks or tears or anything like that, which might make her not want to buy that particular bolt of fabric. Now, how this plays into the pollinators and planting for pollinators. When she did this, she was measuring out a yard because from the tip of your nose to the tip of your fingers is about three feet. Well, it's about a yard. My scientific background tells me that a yard is about a meter and a meter is about three feet. So if you do this and then do this, that is about a three foot by three foot block, simply by stretching your arms out into an L. And that's not that bad. That's only one bush, one tree, one shrub, something like that. It's five, ten different um, perennials, depending on how bushy your perennials get. And it's a whole bunch of annuals, but personally, I don't do annuals very often because I don't have time to plant them all every year. So if that's your thing, great. Um, but that's about what you want. And that's not terribly undoable. That's not too terrible much there. So having those big blocks really is helpful. Now, we want to think about as we're choosing our plants, what type of pollinators do you want to attract? If you want hummingbirds, then of course you want to um, look at something that's red and you want to look at something that has that nice long flower tube to it. Hummingbirds will go to other colored flowers. They will go to plants that have shorter flower tubes but to really attract them and get them in, red and those long flower tubes. This is cardinal flower that you see on the picture here. And oh my gosh, it's a native flower. I absolutely love it. It is a cardinal magnet and we'll talk about it more later. But those are the types of things you wanna keep in mind. It's a flower shape, flower color, and then also flower size. So if you're looking at primarily wanting to attract butterflies, Butterflies like to have a nice landing platform, something that they can come in, they can land, and then they can move around on. So the coneflower that's in this picture, goldenrods, if you think of the plume of goldenrods comes over, they can land, they can walk around, they can drink out of all the flowers. That's the type of shape that you're wanting with the flowers or the flower head to be able to attract butterflies. For bees on the shape, Bees like to have either, again, 
that landing platform that they can land on, crawl over and drink the nectar, collect the pollen from off of there, or they like to have something that they can hang on to, like you see with the pea flowers. This one it happens to be the wild white indigo, where they can hang on, shove their head in, and do their thing if they don't have that nice landing platform. With bees, you're looking at, and pretty much with butterflies too, but especially with bees, you're looking at blue flowers and purple flowers are really awesome. White and yellow flowers are also really good. Red flowers, not so much. Bees cannot see the color red. Um, instead, they see, bee eyes are nothing like our eyes, so it's really hard to um, know exactly what they're seeing and how their vision system works, but it's very different than ours. But part of the way their vision system works is they see contrast. So a red flower against the green vegetation is going to appear more black or gray to them. So it's not invisible like ultraviolet light is to us. Um, it just, it's not the same thing. It doesn't look red to the bees and they're not attracted to it. Having said that, many flowers have ultraviolet components that we don't see because ultraviolet's invisible to us, but the bees can see. So they may go to a red flower that has ultraviolet components to it because they're being attracted to those ultraviolet or they're being attracted by the smell of the pollen or the nectar. And so, yes, you will sometimes see bees on red flowers. I mean, I've got some cardinal flower in my garden. And last year, I was taking the most amazing pictures of this gorgeous little emerald green sweat bee. The most metallic, beautiful, deep emerald green. But it wasn't on the flower on the petals of the flower, it wasn't trying to get down to the nectar. It was on this white part, which is where the pollen is. And it was all curled up around it. And it was just taking as much pollen as it, as it could possibly eat and stuff into its pollen baskets. So they, again, they will go to red as just depends. Flower size is important because a small bee is not going to be able to manipulate as large of a flower as a bigger bee. Um, so with, again, going back to our white wild indigo here, it's a big chunky flower. So it needs a big chunky bee, like a bumblebee or a carpenter bee, or honeybees are kind of on that edge, that smaller edge for them to be able to manipulate, get their head in and get to the nectar and pollen. Smaller bees can sometimes kind of cheat the system. They're not really pollinating, but they're going in and getting the nectar of these larger plants, especially if they can crawl down a tube or something like that. But yeah, so flower size can vary. And if you're trying to go for a specific species or group of, of pollinators, then it's really important to take into the flower shape, color, and size into your choices. If you want all pollinators, just have a variety. Have all kinds of different shapes and sizes and colors, and you'll get a little bit of everything in there. So it doesn't have to be information overload is what I'm trying to say. Know the concepts and then figure out how to apply them for yourself. Kind of going along with the same thing is the idea of if you want specific pollinators, when are they active? So hummingbirds, they are active from or up here in Kentucky, basically from April to October. If you have a hummingbird into November, you've got to um, contact me because there's really cool things possibly going on and I can get you in contact with other people. Um, but that's, again, a whole other, another topic. We could go down so many rabbit holes here. But you want to have flowers blooming from April to October that the hummingbirds would um, use if that's what you're primarily planting for. If you're primarily planting for butterflies, we've got butterflies that will be active in March. I've seen them active on warm days and very early March, definitely by mid-March. But our main butterfly flights are mid-June to mid-July and then mid-August to mid-September. So that's when you wanna have a lot of flowers out there and a lot of stuff going on if you're primarily looking at butterflies. Bee species, different bee species are active at different times of the year. It really has to do with their biology and their life history. Um, Moths, that's where the time of day is. A lot of our moths are night active or they're nocturnal. And so you want to have those night blooming 
flowers for them. So it really all depends. And this is um, this picture here. Let me get my cursor here. This one, this is the red and green um, moth that I was telling you is, in most other parts of the country, is more commonly called the hummingbird moth because, well, it looks more like a hummingbird, whereas the other one looked more like a bumblebee. But yeah, most, we don't have very many of them here. They're here, but not nearly as common. So we just call them all hummingbird moths. But yeah, so again, trying to figure out exactly what time of year, what time of day, all this stuff can get very confusing. If you just want pollinators, again, have simplified, just have lots of different things blooming at all sorts of different times. Those three things blooming at all times of the growing season that we talked about at the very beginning, that simplifies it, that takes it away. But if you want to have specific groups of pollinators that you're going to, knowing this other information can help you just be a little bit more specific for those um, pollinators. Again, if there are specific species that you're wanting to attract, you need to know what plants they need. You wanna make sure you have the adult food and the baby food. And the monarch butterfly is really the most common one that I can use as a reference for this. And it's really one of the best ones because we're most familiar with it. Everybody knows you plant milkweeds for monarchs. I'm always surprised though that the piece that gets left out of that message is that we're not planting milkweeds for the adult monarch butterflies. The adult monarch butterflies perfectly happy to get nectar from other plants. In fact, when they migrate through in the fall, they're on the asters, they're on the golden rods, they're on all these fall blooming plants that are so important for their migration and fueling that migration because we don't have much milkweed still going at that time. Most of the milkweed, not all of the milkweed, has stopped blooming by the time the fall monarch migration happens. The reason why we need milkweed for monarchs is it's baby food. That's the only thing that the caterpillars of the monarch butterfly can eat. And we all know if you don't have babies, you're not going to have the adults. And it's, I mean, that's just basic biology. So you have to have baby food and adult food. But the monarch butterfly is not the only where, place this happens at. Violets. Sometimes they can be an annoyance in the garden. Um, I've actually come to terms with them. I've now used them as a living green mulch in most of my garden beds to kind of keep out the other weeds. And they're pretty. I like them. But our fertility butterflies, the caterpillars eat the violet leaves and the violet vegetation. There is a little native bee that we have. Its name is Andrina viola. As far as I know, it does not have a common name, but the little bee, it's a mining bee, it's one of the ones that digs in the ground and makes its nest in the ground, and it's a solitary bee, so you only, there's, it's one female doing everything there. It's not like a nest or a colony or anything, but this Andrina viola bee, the only thing she feeds to her babies, to her larva, is violet pollen. So if you don't have violets, you can't have Andrina viola in your landscape. Um, other examples are the squash bees. Squash, pumpkins, gourds, all of those plants, their ancestors are native to North America. And so we have their native pollinator, which is the squash bee. And the only thing that baby squash bees, the lar squash bee larvae eat is squash pollen or pollen from that cucurbit family. So your squashes, your pumpkins, your gourds. So it's really important, again, if you want specific species to make sure that you're providing for all life stages. Also, as we're thinking about making our plant choices, I think it's really important to recognize, and this is something that we forget about sometimes, or at least we don't actually come out and say it is that we're not talking about making plant choices to attract pollinators off in the wild blue yonder, yonder in some pristine area that's never been touched. We're talking about making plant choices to attract pollinators to our yards, our gardens, our communities, 
are built landscapes. And as such, our needs, our wants, our desires, they all fit into the equation too, and they need to be considered. So as you're picking your plants and evaluating, is this a good pollinator plant for me? Is this a good plant to attract pollinators for me? Think about, do you want your area to be very formal or informal? If you want very formal gardens, you want to avoid plants that are more aggressive. They're going to spread more because that's going to get too wild and crazy and just be too much maintenance for a very formal garden. There's other much more well-behaved plants that will stay where they're supposed to be, spread much more slowly. Those are better fits for you. If you want a rough and tumble and let's just throw everything out there and have this big prairie meadow looking wild natural feel to it, yeah, go for those more aggressive plants because that's going to help you compete against the weeds. They're going to spread more. It's going to give you more of that natural look that you probably are looking for. Um, grasses actually have a really important part in pollinator gardens. And I know many of us are going, what? Grasses? No, we want to get rid of those. We just want pretty flowers. Actually, go back to that. You got to provide baby food as well as adult food piece that I was talking about earlier. Because many of our skippers, um, those are the butterflies that a lot of times you'll see them. They have one set of wings that's like this, flat out. And then they have the other set of wings that's up more like this. And it ends up looking like um, a sailboat almost. Those are the skippers. And a lot of those species, the caterpillars eat grasses. So the females will lay their eggs on grasses. The eggs will hatch. And then the caterpillars will eat the grasses. Grasses have a place in this um, community and attracting pollinators. It's also important to think about what works for your yard. Do you want those wildflowers? Do you want those pretty flowers out here? Or is a tree or a shrub a better choice for you and your environment? I've had so many people come to me and say, I want to plant a pollinator garden. Our whole neighborhood wants to plant pollinator gardens and we'd love to do all this, but We've got all these big trees and we just can't bring ourselves to cut them down. What do we do, Shannon? What kind of plants, what, what kind of trees are they? And they start naming them off. And I'm like, you've got a pollinator garden. Those trees, they've either got flowers way up there where you can't see them, where the butterflies and the bees and everything else are using them, or they're really good baby food. You have the nursery for the pollinators. So many of our caterpillars actually feed on tree species. So there's just as much of a place for trees and shrubs as there are for wildflowers. And in fact, when you're thinking about trees and shrubs, I call trees the skyscra skyscrapers of the natural community because you can pack more flowers into a smaller horizontal space. So it's much easier for the pollinators to go along those flowers and to get to different flowers to gather more nectar, gather more pollen than it is if they're having to fly long distances to get that same number of flowers spread out through a meadow or prairie across that horizontal space. Also, again, continuing with, this is our built landscapes and we have a role in those too, is how much space do you really have for pollinator plants? And I ask that in all earnest because I have so many people come to me as well that say, I want to plant for pollinators, but I only have a small postage stamp yard, or I live in a, an apartment and I only have a balcony. I only have a small little space. Can I do anything? Oh yeah, there's a lots of plants that you can plant for pollinators that are in container, that you can plant in containers that you can have in this very small space. Again, they're not gonna be your wild and crazy, rough and tumble um, plants that I would suggest for somebody that's got more acreage. But I mean, in these small areas, some of the ones that I suggest the most are culinary herbs and summer veggies. Because a lot of times, if you have that small space, you need everything to do double duty. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to plant this just for pollinators. You could, but that limits everything else. But if you plant veggies and um, culinary herbs, 
you're feeding the pollinators and you're feeding the gardener. So it gets, again, that double duty. There's ways to do this no matter how much space you have here. And then, of course, we want to take into all of our normal site considerations that we would normally think of when planting anything. So is it wet? Is it dry? Is it clay soils or sandy soils or sunny or partly sunny or all those things come into play because there are some amazing plants out there for pollinators that will only grow in certain, character, certain conditions. Um, butterfly weed, the orange milkweed that everybody loves is an example of this. It likes dry soil. It likes to be neglected and forgotten about. If you put it in wet soil, it's going to die. It will rot out and die. If you, I tell people all the time, you can love butterfly milkweed to death. Put it in really rich soil, yeah, it may or may not survive. Put it off and forget it and don't water it for, well, get it established, but then forget it for a bit. It's going to do just fine most of the time. So it's, again, knowing those site characteristics and how they fit in with the different plants. The same thing that you would look for no matter what you were planting. We also want to think about the plant's horticultural history. And I can start to hear people groaning now saying, okay, we're getting too many things to think about. But this is really important because not all plants produce the same amount of nectar and pollen. Um, these two flowers that I've got here are a good example. And that over here, we have our wild native Carolina rose. Here we have an ornamental rose. And our wild roses, you can see just a few petals, enough to attract the pollinators, very open, easy to get to those nectaries, easy to get to the pollen, very easy for pollinators. That's going to attract your pollinators. Contrast that to our ornamental rose, which has been bred to appeal to humans with lots of big, showy, flashy petals that cover up those nectaries, cover up that pollen, make it much harder for a pollinator to get to what it's trying to get to. So which one of these are you going to go to if you're a little bee or a butterfly? Most of us are going to take the easy route and we're going to go for the one that's much easier to get to. So when we're thinking about this, we're looking at wild type varieties. We're looking at old fashioned varieties. We don't want to get the ones that have double petals or triple petals because that's where it starts to get harder for our pollinators to get to that nectar and the pollen. Typically, we also want to look at species that are not hybrids. So a hybrid is when you cross two species. And you often get hybrids that are either sterile or not as fertile. Both of those translate in the world of pollinators to no nectar and pollen or very little nectar and pollen. Doesn't always happen in the world of plants. Sometimes you can have very fertile um, hybrids in the plant world. But unless you know better, the safe assumption is to not go with a hybrid. And the way you know whether it's a hybrid or not is you look at the plant tag, you look where they have the scientific name. And if it says blah, blah, X, blah, that second and third blahs, the ones on either side of the X, that's the two species that were crossed to make that hybrid. So when you see that X, start going, hmm. Maybe this isn't as good of a choice for pollinators, unless you know from experience that, yes, this one actually is a hybrid that still produces lots of nectar and pollen. I'm also going to suggest that you consider whether a native plant is right for you. And a native plant, by definition, is a plant that has naturally evolved in the area where it's found. There's one huge challenge to that definition though, and that is that there's no set definition to the size of the area. So we can define that area as whatever we, we want. Um, it could be the nation, it could be the east of the um, Mississippi River, it could be our state, it could be our county. Technically by this definition, we could define it as whatever we want. And 
if we go with that line of thinking, I could go to California and if I could get a redwood or a Joshua tree or something like that and bring it back and plant it in Kentucky, would that make me have a native plant, native Joshua tree or a native sequoia or a native redwood here in Kentucky? Most people would say no. And I love doing that and using this example in live presentations where I can see everybody's faces and they look at me like I'm absolutely insane. And that's why I use such a crazy exaggerated example. But we often go to native plant stores and native plant catalogs and online native plant sources. And we order any and all wildflowers that we want because they're native, right? Native to somewhere, not necessarily native to here. They didn't necessarily evolve here. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with an exotic plant um, in and of itself, as long as it's not invasive. And we'll talk about that in a second. But I like your natives because and I choose those more often because our native plants are the natural food sources for our caterpillars, for our baby bees. So if I'm planting native plants, I don't have to usually think so much about whether I need to also provide baby food as well as the flower or the tree or the whatever, because that's the natural food source for our native animals. So it just kind of works out. It's less thinking and work for me. I also like it because it helps to um, it helps to bring in other things like songbirds and reptiles and everything else that I absolutely love. But it really does. It also because those plants are native to here. And when I say native, I'm often using the way I term it or I define it is native to the state. So if I'm planting native plants, they're used to our crazy Kentucky soils and crazy Kentucky weather, which means I don't have to baby it as much. If the spigot turns off on the rain in April and it doesn't start again until September, and to, except for a few pop-up thunderstorms in July, we have those years. I remember a few of them. As long as the plan is established, I don't have to worry about it too much. It's probably going to be just fine if I planted it in the right location. Again, they're evolved to this. They're, this is normal for them. And so I can get around some of the things that I might have to worry about or be more concerned about with exotics. The next thing that I want to briefly mention is as you're picking and choosing your plants for pollinators, please Find out whether or not it's an invasive species. Take those extra few minutes. An invasive species is a non-native species whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic harm, environmental harm, or harm to human health. And that's the legal definition of an invasive species. Invasive species vary depending on what state you're in. This is the link and the place to go to to find out our invasive species here in Kentucky. And it's updated every four, five, six, 10 years, something like that. It really varies as to how long they take between the updates. But it's really important to do this. And the reason why it's important to do this is because many of our invasive species can still be bought in nurseries all across the state. Um, some of the common ones are bush honeysuckle, wintergreen, Bradford pears. Yes, pollinators will use some of these plants, but the greater harm that they do is not worth the little bit of extra value that the pollinator yeast might bring. And there's better plants for the pollinators anyway. And oftentimes they're not being used at all as baby food. So again, this is another big rabbit hole that I'm not gonna go down to. I give whole talks about the subject and why it's important to not to plant invasives, think about more natives, but these are things that you need to think about no matter what your choices are as you're plant, um, choosing which plants to plant for pollinators. And then the other thing is just pure practicality. Do you want to plant plants or seeds? Seeds, the pro is they're cheaper. There's a lot, they're a lot cheaper than planting plants. Also, you can usually find a greater diversity of them. It's easier to find them out there everywhere. You can find more different things. The con is, especially if you're talking about native plants, 
is that some of them need special treatments in order for the seeds to germinate. Some of them need multiple seasons in order to germinate. So a hot, dry summer, and then a cold, moist winter. And sometimes they need two cycles of that. So like a full year or two in order to stimulate the germination. It gets really, really complicated. But those are the things that if you're planting seeds, if you want those plants, you need to know about. And some of them are very slow growers. So it might take multiple seasons in order to get to something that you can even plant in a garden. Plants, on the other hand, the pro is you get to see what you got. You can say, yes, I have this plant. Yes, the roots are good. Always look at the roots. The roots are actually more important than the vegetation at the top. But look at it and you can say, yes, this is a great plant. And I don't have to worry about getting it to germinate because look, it's already germinated. Um, the cons against that, um, you're limited to what you can find somebody else growing in order to get it. And they, they are more expensive than buying a packet of seed. Again, your choices are going to be determined by your unique wants, desires, needs situation. Now let's get into the plants because I know everybody's been wanting plants and I love talking about the specific plants too. But again, remember, this is not meant to be in any sort of way, a perfect list, an end all be all list, this is simply some of the plants that I like. I grow in my own gardens for pollinators. They are ones that I know work well for me. They're going to work well throughout Kentucky. Uh, they'll work well in Indiana. That was one of the other states that I saw as we were looking at the chat going through to begin with. So they're going to work most of these places. They're all natives because for me and my yard, I really emphasize the native plants. I'm not a purist. I have non-native exotic plants as well, but I emphasize the natives in my planning because when you look at the wider ecological value, they are extremely important there. And it's easier. Like I said, um, they're already adapted to our crazy soils, crazy weather. Um, I'm providing baby food as well as adult food. I don't have to go, okay, what does that specific um, butterfly needs, say a pearl crescent butterfly. Okay, I've got the butterfly. What are the babies going to need? If I've got a lot of native plants, I've probably got what they need as well. And with pearl crescent butterflies, they eat a lot of the asters, and I love asters. Members of the aster family. So yeah, I've got plenty of those in my garden. I also heavily focused these choices on summer blooming plants because. Again, I'm assuming that you've already got a garden. You're not starting from scratch. Your neighbors have gardens. There's other flowers blooming around us, and we all do the same thing. First sign of spring, we're all out there. We're all in our gardens. We're all planting, and we have all these beautiful flowers that bloom in the spring. And a lot of our wild trees, our native trees, also bloom in the spring. Our fruit trees bloom in the spring. So there's lots of stuff out there for the pollinators in the spring. And then summer comes and it's hot and it's humid and the ticks and the chiggers and the mosquitoes are out and it's just, yeah, who wants to be out there doing gardening work in the middle of the summer? I mean, we might get a few hours in the mo early morning, a few hours in the late evening, but a lot of the day, it, yuck. Most of us just don't want to be out there. And so there's a lot of times when you see a gap, there isn't as much blooming. And I hear this all the time. There's nothing to, that blooms in the summer, but there are. We just got to plant the right things. So again, I'm going to focus on some of those that fill in that gap and that time period there. And pretty much all of these are either a perennial or they're trees and shrubs because I've already told you, I don't do annuals. I just don't have time for them. So. Getting started, basswood. Basswood is an amazing tree. And like I said, trees are awesome for pollinators because you get lots and lots of flowers in a very small horizontal area. So they can go up and down the tree and get all the flower, go to all the flowers, visit all the flowers without having to fly long distances to get there. And basswood's used by honeybees and native bees and butterflies. And it's a host tree for quite a few species of caterpillars. And then the birds come in, they eat the caterpillars in. Yeah, it's an amazing tree. Devil's walking stick 
is a tall shrub short tree, depending on how you want to classify it. And it blooms in July and August, and it's gorgeous. Oh my gosh, it has these big plumes of bright white flowers. It looks almost tropical in its nature. And bees love it, and butterflies love it. And then and it's a host plant for several different um, species of caterpillars. And then it produces berries, and the songbirds come in, and they eat all the berries. And it's a phenomenal wildlife tree. But it has thorns. It gets the name Devil's Walking Stick, honestly. Because when you find this growing in the wild, a lot of times the ones that I see especially, they are eh, that big around, that big around, good walking stick size. And all around the trunk, they have rings of thorns going up. And they're, they're perfect little rings of thorns. Definitely not what you want to grab a hold of, though, and use as a walking stick. So if you're going to plant devil's walking stick, choose your location wisely. Don't put it next to the kid's swing set. If you like your neighbors, don't plant it up against the fence row between you and your neighbors. If you don't like your neighbors, well, then maybe planting devil's walking stick there is a, might be a better option. But you really do want to think about this. Again, your choices may not be my choices. Button bush is another one that I absolutely love because it attracts everything. And again, it blooms in that midsummer time period. It has these little white balls. You can see it there, flower of flowers. And honeybees and native bees and butterflies and hummingbirds will all come and they'll drink the nectar and gather the pollen. And then it is the um, host plant for several species of our big moths, those big colorful moths. This is one of the host plants for them. So it's amazing. In the wild, we tend to find it growing in areas that are wetter. It likes to have its feet wet. But in a cultivated setting, in a garden landscape setting, it'll grow just fine in medium moisture soil. It doesn't need that really wet soil. Now, if we have one of those time periods where we have months without rain, you may need to give it a little bit of water. But for everyday, normal years, it's going to do just fine in medium moisture soil. I know a lot of people that have planted this by the rain spouts or where the air conditioner condensation comes off of. And just that extra little bit of moisture has made them grow humongous for them and grow really well. Butterfly milkweed, again, we, sh we can't not talk about the milkweeds when we're talking about planting for pollinators, especially today. So butterfly milkweeds are a really good choice when it comes to milkweeds. The butterflies, your monarchs, are going to use it more for laying their eggs on in the later part of the season than in the earlier part of the season. If they have a choice during the early season, they're going to go to the taller milkweeds that have the bigger, uh, bigger leaves. But butterfly milkweed is a really good one. And if they don't have the choice of the bigger, taller milkweeds, then they will go to the butterfly milkweed even during the early part of the season. Now, whatever you do, please do not buy tropical milkweed, tropical milkweed or um, Mexican butterfly weed or let's see what scarlet milkweed, scarlet butterfly milkweed. Those are all different names for the same species. Um, you can find tropical milkweed pretty easily in a lot of your big box stores now, traditional nurseries. It's much easier to grow and propagate than um, at least from seed. Once you get it in the ground, it's pretty much the same thing. But once from seed on a commercial setting, it's much easier to propagate than some of our native milkweeds are. But there's a lot of information coming out of the University of Georgia Athens right now that says that planting, these, planting this tropical species, which grows as an annual here in Kentucky and in most of the eastern U.S., minus Florida, um, in the coastal plain area. It'll also grow year-round in like South Georgia and stuff. But for most of us, we plant it as an annual. Don't do that because, like I said, the UGA research is starting to show that this is not a good idea and it can actually cause issues with our monarch butterflies. Common milkweed. This is one of the tall pink milkweeds that the butterflies will lay lots of eggs on, um, especially early in the season. It's one of the ones that they use a lot of. 
but it's not good for every situation because it sends out lots of runners. It spreads a lot by clones and runners. So if you've got a postage stamp yard or you want to have this very neat, um, formal butterfly garden, this is not the milkweed choice that you need to be making. In that case, look at rose milkweed or swamp milkweed. And before anybody says this, I know your yard is not a swamp. It's called swamp milkweed because in the wild, in nature, we find it growing in wetter places than we find common milkweed. But in a garden setting, again, where we can water if we need to, and you're usually not going to need to with it, it will grow just fine in medium moisture soil. So this is the tall pink milkweed that I suggest for people that want that more formal garden setting or that have smaller gardens where they don't, they just can't have everything go wild and crazy and take over. So that's the best option there if you want a taller pink milkweed. Cardinal flower. And I've already talked about it a little bit. So I'm just going to say, you want butterflies, plant this one. Give it a wetter area. It likes to be a little bit wetter. The more sun, the wetter it needs to be, basically. And hummingbirds are going to go insane over this thing. Your native bees are going to come. They're going to collect the pollen off of it. It's just absolutely amazing. This is a hummingbird magnet I've had off of a three foot by three foot area of this. I've had hummingbirds dive bomb me if I came anywhere near there to try and do any work. So yeah, can't say enough good things about the cardinal flower. If it fits where you're at. Great blue lobelia is a, close car, uh, is a close cousin to the cardinal flower. And again, absolutely amazing plant. It likes it wetter rather than drier, but it will take drier um, soils than the cardinal flower. Again, you're going to attract hummingbirds and butterflies and just a little bit of everything loves it. Purple cone flower is another one. I always include this because everything does love it. From your bees to your butterflies, they all come to it. It's really good host plant for a lot of our different caterpillars. And it's easy to find. And it is a native that grows pretty easily in our soils. Cup plant is another one that I really love and absolutely adore my garden. But it's also one that I encourage people to think very carefully about because it can be highly aggressive. It sends out um, clones and the songbirds will come in and they'll spread the seeds, and it spreads like crazy, and it will take over if you let it. It's not for those very postage stamp, neat, formal yards. But if you've got space to let it go crazy, think about this one, because in July, August, September, it's covered in those little yellow sunflower-looking flowers, and I've had every species of bee imaginable, every species of butterfly imaginable, on this plant, I mean, it is a huge magnet to everything, and it creates its own little ecosystem because it's called cup plant, because the leaves come around the stem, and they form this watertight cup there that during rains or during heavy dews will fill up with water, and then you get great tree frogs kind of sitting in the cup looking at you. The birds will come down, they'll kind of drink out of the cup. I mean, it's just, it's fun. I love it. So it's a good one if you have the right place. And again, this is where thinking about those concepts of including us in our plant choices really comes into play. Sunflowers, they're amazing. Um, all kinds of different species. We have native species that are perennials. You can also get your agricultural species. Be careful if you're looking for horticultural species. Because some of our horticultural species, especially the ones that were designed for cut flowers or developed for cut flowers, they no longer produce pollen. And they do produce nectar, so you do still get some bees, some butterflies, but you're going to get more if you have these nectar or these pollen producing as well as nectar producing sunflower species. Mountain mints are one that there's lots of species, they're not as well known. Um, but they're native plants. They're amazing when it comes to providing that summer flowers. They'll also pr um, produce flowers for a pretty long period of time. They are a native mint. They will spread, but they're not going to go anywhere near spearmint, peppermint, crazy spreading. Bee bombs, 
oh my gosh, bee balms are amazing for so many different reasons. This is Monarda fistulosa, our native um, blue or purple one. Red one works just fine as well, and that's going to attract more hummingbirds, although the hummingbirds come to my purple one as well. And then asters. Asters are another one that is absolutely amazing. We have so many native asters, and these are, again, perennial. They're native. They're perennial. They'll come back every year. Depending on the different species, they can have an amazingly long bloom time, going from late June, early July, all the way through early to mid-November, I mean, beyond those first couple of frosts that we have. And we've got blue ones and purple ones and white ones and just all kinds of different ones. And they are such phenomenal resources for our butterflies and our bees that, yeah, you, you can't go wrong planting our native asters here. And that has been a little bit over an hour. So that's why I was kind of rushing through some of those at the, at the end there. But like I said, it's not an end all be all list. It is a list of things that I have plants that I know really work well in my yard that I think might work well in yours if they also fit into your unique situation. But something to think about there. So I'm going to say thank you now. And here's all my contact information. If you would like to, um, I'll stay on and ask, answer all the questions that you guys have or until Faye says, shut up, Shannon, click bye. Um, <laughs> I've said that in, um, in like online position uh, talks or like real in-person talks and said, you're going to have to take the microphone from me pot uh, potentially. Everybody laughs and then eventually if it's a really engaged crowd, everybody realizes she's right. She'll stay here forever and keep talking as long as we keep asking questions. So somebody comes and takes the microphone from me. But yeah, so here's all my information. If you are interested in these things, I do have a weekly blog and a weekly podcast called Backyard Ecology. You can sign up to get emails. You can subscribe to them. That's off of my websites. Uh, I also have my book. I do webinars. I've actually, usually about once a month in February, I'm being a little over ambitious. I'm doing two webinars this month, but you can find all that information on my website and I see lots of questions coming in. So I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Shannon. That was really excellent. And I love um, the whole process of thinking through, like including us in the plant choices and how important that is um, because there's so many lists out there, like you said, and um, it can become overwhelming. So helping us through those decisions um, is so great. So thank you so much. You're welcome. It was um, fun. I'm going to dive into the questions here. Um, the first one that we have is, is there a distance you should keep between vegetable garden and the pollinator plant areas to get them to visit the vegetable garden? I don't. <laughs> You can, I haven't seen anything that's actually scientific research that says that, but at the same time, just kind of thinking it through, I wouldn't want to necessarily keep it too far away because it's going to make it harder for them to find. If you got all your pollinators over there in the pollinator garden, then they may not come over here to your vegetable garden. So I kind of mix and match, I mean, I don't necessarily have my native plants in the pol in my vegetable garden. I've got different beds for them, but I'm not putting long distances between them. It's like rows between them type thing. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and then a question here from uh, Jenny saying, Shannon, thanks for sharing your knowledge. What are the best native plants for the earliest spring benefit to pollinators? You're welcome. Um, I would ask you which pollinators you're looking at because some of our spring ephemerals are absolutely amazing, but they're pollinated by ants, which is another one that most people don't really worry about too much. I like spring beauties. It's one of our little native wildflowers. They're hard to find as a native wildflower plant. Um, don't go out and dig them from the woods, please. But yeah, they're hard to find, but we've got some native bees that are pollen specialists, so that's all they use. But if you don't want native plants, most of, most of the plants that we plant in the early spring, um, some of your marigolds, don't go with the big fluffy poofy ones, go with the old fashioned normal um, varieties. Those will work. 
we've got a lot of things that do already that are already out there in our landscape though that really bloom well and do well for our spring pollinators especially our early spring pollinators without us planting them so everybody's got red buds everybody's got dogwoods the red buds especially are huge plants for pollinators um, some of our other dogwoods not necessarily southern florida dog, or southern flowering dogwood the one that has um that we think of as a dogwood um, there's some other bushier shrubs that are also in the dogwood family that are really good willows can be really good for our spring pollinators just letting your yard weeds bloom let, let, let's take something off of our plate and not have to plant let's just let our yard weeds bloom so the purple henbit and dead nettle those plants that turn the yards purple everything loves them and you don't have to worry about planting them just don't go spray them. So those are really good plants. Uh, yeah, we can just keep going on and on. Helleborus is not a native, but the bees and stuff love it and they will come to it when it's um, blooming. Excellent, that is great. And she did follow up with early spring for honeybees as, um, as the, the pollinator, um, which you may have you know, answered some of the things that would be good for them in the trees and everything. Tree, honeybees specifically, and that's where I, kind of guessed she might be going my best things for the early season and i'm assuming by early season she means now through late march <laughs> is to look at letting the hen bitten dead nettle bloom red maples are amazing that's one of our earliest nectar sources for them and then we're looking at a lot of trees we're looking at a whole lot of trees coming up because this is when the trees start blooming and there's not a lot to plant that's going to bloom right now that's going to do better than what's out there uh, with that. And actually, that's one of the classes that I have coming up is the nectar flows for, and it's aimed at for beekeepers and understanding when our nectar flows are, which as soon as we get that warm spell in February, we'll start here in Kentucky. Great. And that class can be found on the website, I'm assuming. Yes. Great. Um, the next question was, how do you go about sowing seed for larger wildflower area areas? Okay, larger area, I'm going to assume that this is something that you would define, that you would measure in terms of acreages or percentages of acreages. So half an acre, quarter of an acre, something like that. Not something that you would measure as feet. So going by that definition, because I know larger can mean different things to different people. Number one thing is make sure you do good site preparation. If you mess up on the site preparation, if you skip the site preparation, you're done for. I'm sorry. That's what it is. Um, you've got to get that good site preparation. Get all the weed seeds killed off. Um, it could take a year to do it. Um, letting it spraying it down with an herbicidal spray killing it all off um you can solarize it or put plastic or whatever on whichever way you decide to do it pull it off let things re-sprout do it again cover it all up or spray it whichever way you choose to do pull it off let it sprout you want to do this until you're not getting many seeds re-sprouting don't re-till it because as soon as you retill it at that point, you're going to bring more weed seeds up to the surface and you just have to start all over again. So that site preparation is key. Then you want to really kind of pack it, not pack hard it down, but you want to be able to step on, leave a footprint, but not like sink into the dirt. So you don't want it super hard, but you don't want it super soft and mushy either and then you want to plant your seeds and you can do broadcast you can do no-till drill if it's a really big area and you have access to a no-till drill and a lot of the um, fsa offices have ones that they can rent to you um, so that's an option if you've got a depending on how large your larger area is um, you can broadcast it if you're looking at doing native seeds a lot of our native seeds are teeny tiny so you may need to put a carrier in there and like kitty litter or something like that that can help to spread the seeds and so that you don't just get all clump of seeds right here and you've still got half an acre to go and it's all in a three-foot area so it really is this 
spreading it out and then tamp it all down so that you got good con um, soil to seed contact. You don't necessarily have to go back over and try and cover the seeds up. Too much light is better than not enough light with these. And if you're looking at native seeds especially, I'll make this even easier. Go to my website, download my blog or listen to my blog, or not blog, listen to the podcast episode from Roundstone Native Seed. And Robert from Roundstone actually goes over the whole process in there that he takes people through when planting these larger um, native plant seed plantings. Excellent. That is great. Thank you. And I know um, our local conservation district here has the no-till no -till seed drills and, um, and most in, in the county do. So um, that's a great resource. Um, yes, FSA, NRCS, extension yep. offices. I don't care where you are. Make friends with those people. They're amazing. I so look up to everything you guys do and thank you all for it. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, there's a lot of equipment people don't realize that you can rent through all of our departments. Um, so yes, thank you for that. And you can um, point us in other directions because you may not have the answer, but you know who probably does. And I love that too. Exactly. Making those connections is sometimes a big part of it for sure. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is any non-toxic recommendations for deterring milkweed bugs that won't deter monarchs and pollinators? And that's a question I get a lot. So I'll be interested in your, uh, your answer. Plant lots and lots of stuff and lots and lots of milkweed and let the natural ecosystem develop and it all works out just fine because the milkweed bugs, they're native and it's all part of the natural system. So they're not going to really overtake and take over it. Um, just let it be and it all works out fine in the end. The little orange aphids um, that come onto the plants, those aren't um, native. Those are actually an exotic introduced pest species. Depends on what I do with those depends on exactly what the situation is. Out in my fields, out in the big gardens and stuff, I just let it be because there's some little bitty, almost microscopic parasitoid wasps that will come in if you allow them to develop and they actually lay their eggs in those teeny tiny orange milkweed af or um, oleander aphids, those orange aphids on the milkweed. And so if you allow them to hatch out of those, then you get more of them and you're again building that ecosystem. In the nursery or on plants that are in the garden in an area that I just really don't want to look at the orange milkweed bugs and it's just driving me crazy, Squish, 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 squish. That's the best way that I can find to do it. Some people say spray it with soap or spray it with water, but when you start doing that, you risk knocking off any um, caterpillars that might be on there. So I don't know. Sometimes it just makes me feel better to go squish and be done with it too. <laughs> I agree. That's very rewarding to squish them. And um, the kids love it too. And they're sometimes more brave than we are about squashing bugs. <laughs> Because <laughs> we can be grossed out by it, and they're uh, excited to do it. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm not seeing any further questions. Just lots of very informative and motivational, ready to start planning. Thank you so much. Awesome presentation. Um, here's one that just came in. Hi, Shannon. Are there specific plants you would recommend to attract flies and beetles in the spring. We grow pawpaw trees for fruit which bloom in the spring and are pollinated by flies and beetles. Having lots of pawpaws in there is going to help a lot. Um, trying to get it to that pawpaw bloom time is going to be interesting. Your tulip poplars, anything in the magnolia family are beetle pollinated primarily. I mean, they're amazing trees for everything else because they produce lots and lots of nectar. And in fact, here in Kentucky, I mean, going back to the honeybees, that's one of our major nectar sources for the honey that's produced in Kentucky during the spring. But um, it's also pretty much pollinated to a large degree by beetles. And so are all of your magnolias. So it really goes back and forth with that. Um, 
having that wide variety of plants. I see a lot of flies on my common milkweed. I think it's going to come down a lot to which, or has the potential to come down to what particular beetle species and fly species are your big pawpaw pollinators. And I don't know those, I'll be honest. So I can't give you specific plants for them, but think white flowers, think yellow flowers, think red flowers. That's red and marine flower. those not cardinal flower red, but those deep marine pop-off colored flowers. Those are the colors that are really going to attract your flies and your beetles, especially anything pop-off shaped, um, that kind of deep maroon color and kind of that hanging down type thing, or something that's up like this and smells rancid like dead meat. Those are skunk cabbage is one of the ones that always is used as an example. But yeah, those are the type of characteristics that are going to bring in more of your flies and your beetles. Now, how much skunk cabbage you want to plant around your pawpaw trees, I'll let you make that decision. <laughs> Great, that was very helpful. And while we're talking about pawpaws, I did mention in the beginning um, obviously, you've seen our flyer where we had these classes scheduled through March, but we just planned out April through June. We'll be launching that soon, but just as a little teaser, um, we'll be having a class on growing pawpaws April the 8th. So. Oh, I may have to sign up for that one. All right. <laughs> um, let's see. If you have any other questions, I'm not seeing any, so if I miss them, um, go ahead and type that in again, or if the other uh, agents on the call if you see some that I miss. Okay, wait, 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 wait. I got a couple. Okay. One was direct message to me. I'm trying to scroll through as well oh, okay. as we go. Great. Um, asking about cutting back the milkweeds. That's a really good question. And it also kind of goes, um, I'll even expand it out to some extent too. So what we're finding out is that if you cut back some of these plants, milkweeds is one. Um, goldenrods, asters, they'll do it as well. If you cut them back, then they will come back and they will rebloom later in the year. And you can do this before they bloom the first time too. So if you go through, say, and for the goldenrods, go through, say, in June and cut the field, then they're going to bloom, come back up, and they'll, they'll be shorter a lot of times, but they'll bloom later. So instead of blooming in August, September, they'll bloom September, October type time period. With the milkweeds, there's some research coming out of uh, multiple states and actually out of Canada as well. Michigan's doing one of the colleges in Michigan. I'm not going to say which one because I can't remember whether it's Michigan State or University of Michigan. Um, so anyway, one of the Michigan colleges and universities is doing a lot of research right now and has a citizen science project going on looking at going out, cutting back the milkweed before it blooms so that they don't come back later and bloom later into the season and extend the resource, not just for, not so much for the butterflies themselves, which I mean, it does, and for the bees and everything else that uses it, but looking at providing that tenderer, fresher vegetation for the caterpillars. That's the specific reason for doing it for the milkweeds. And it does. And so there's a lot of research going on there. But, and, okay, spoiler alert, I'm going to try, I haven't contacted them yet, but I'm going to try and contact some of the researchers on that Michigan project to get them on the Backyard Ecology podcast. I've also just gotten, I'm in the process of setting up a time to have the people from UGA that's doing the research on the tropical milkweeds come and talk to us on the Backyard Ecology podcast as well. One of the things that's come out of the UGA papers, though, is that one of the things with the tropical milkweed, especially further north, well, anywhere really, is that it looks like one of the th cues for the monarch caterpillars to turn into these butter... Okay, let me back up here. Whether the monarchs emerge or become a reproductively active butterfly or whether they go into that diapause that putting the reproductive um, development on hold basically to do the migration is determined in the caterpillar stage 
And it's been shown multiple times through multiple research that, mo that all of the butterflies in Mexico are in that sexual diapause, that sexual pause. They're not developed um, sexually or reproductively at that point. That doesn't happen until the spring when they start back north. But a few might migrate part of the way being sexually active, but very few, if any, get anywhere near Mexico. So one of the things coming out of the UGA research is that the tropical milkweeds, they don't, they don't start to die back like at the same time periods that our regular milkweeds, our, our native milkweeds do. And that's helping to cue the caterpillars that are eating the tropical milkweed to develop into these reproductively active monarch butterflies. So that's going to impact how many butterflies get to Mexico because they're being reproductively active and not putting their energy into migrating. So you want them to kind of die back to kind of cue and to go, do your thing, go into migration stage. So I've got a huge question now, and it's in my notes that if I can get the Michigan people to come on and do research is to ask them, how does this research from UGA, which is saying, that the monarchs need, the caterpillars need to have that dying back of the vegetation in order to go to the next step and kind of spur that migration stage versus cutting back the milkweeds so that we've got more good vegetation, high quality vegetation for the monarchs, caterpillars later in the summer. How does that mesh? And I don't know the answer to that. So when you ask me, should we do it? Maybe. I don't know, and I'm not sure there is an answer yet, but it is something that a lot of people are doing and are looking at. That's some of the active research going on right now. Wow, that's really fascinating. And I hope that um, you'll be able to get them on the podcast because I'd love to, to hear that, um, the answer to that. Yeah, I, so. I don't know, and I don't... Yeah. I don't know if they know because this research out of UGA, some of it's very, very recent. So they've already started the research and, and it may just be, we don't know yet. That's another project and I, we'll see what they say. Yeah. Wow. Well, I don't want to keep you um, past our time and I'm not seeing any further questions. So if anybody has one last final quick question, um, I have time to answer that, but otherwise um, we can wrap up here and. Um, like I said, you can, uh, if you're already signed up for the classes we have um, this month, then you're good to go. Um, and if not, the, you can still register for, for the remaining classes. Um, and we'll be putting out soon our April through June um, class list. So thank you all so much for joining today. Thank you so much, Shannon, uh, for oh, this thank you wonderful guys. presentation. We appreciate you so much. Thanks. Bye, everyone. <laughs>